Hello, this is bassist and vocalist Nathan East, checking in from Los Angeles, California, here in the States. And you're watching me on Jazz Across the Pond with the Jazz Cat and Mr. G. Let's have some fun. I hope you enjoy. Tonight's guest, a very, very special guest, basically a much, much in demand bass player who has appeared on over 2,000 tracks. Unbelievable. He, I think he's going to go into the Guinness Book of Records as the most demand <laughs> bass player in the world. <laughs> and so our mission on Jazz Across the Pond, our mission was to try to get hold of this gentleman and get him on the show. 
We have searched high and low. We've gone from far to wide. We've gone north to south. I think you know where we're going. We went from <laughs> west to eventually we got him. Ladies and gentlemen, please join us with Nathan East. Hey, hey everybody. How you doing? We're good. We're good. Oh, it's sir, this is an amazing to get you on our show. We've got so much to get through. Now, let's get straight down to it. Okay, then. Nathan East, born December in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, to Thomas and Gwendolyn East. You're one of eight uh, children, five boys, three girls. You were raised in San Diego, where your, San Diego, where your family moved when you were the age of four. You first started playing the cello. Now, not all your fans may not realize that, but you started to play the cello at the seventh and right through to ninth grade. At the local high school, at the age of 14, Bear in mind, Bob James was four when he started playing the piano. You were a little bit <laughs> later on from that. You were 14 when you took the place and you started playing in churches with your brothers Raymond and David. Nathan, please tell our followers more about your childhood, your family, and your first introductory to the bass, please. Well, thank you so much. It, it seems you have the story pretty much <laughs> a little better than I do, but no, it's, it's a pleasure to be here, first of all, and thank you for having me. And it's, it's a... Uh, I love the fact that we're in three different locations on, on the planet, three different time zones, but, but we're able to communicate this way. And so I think that's one thing. Amazing. The, yeah, the pandemic kind of has given us this, uh, this extra layer of, of communication that we, uh, we weren't used to before. So uh, thanks. And, and yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been quite a journey. Uh, still feel like I'm just kind of traveling down that road and uh you know all those things you were describing are so many years ago mm -hmm. <laughs> that that uh you know i just feel like it's a blessing to still be here doing it you know uh, you know in, in the middle of even in the middle of the times that we're going through now and think about it nathan would you ever have imagined that someone would say that you're one of the most recorded bassists in the music industry of all time you know what that's I, pretty incredible i i kind of had a little dream you know, when I was, when I would look toward the north to LA from San Diego and, and think, wow, wouldn't it be great, you know, to, to be on that list of, of people, you know, on everybody's call list. And, uh, well, I've actually, before magic. Kevin asked you a question, I've seen you live in concert. In 97, I think it was, I went to Paris and I saw you on the Phil Collins concert. And it was oh. an actual fact, because there was, uh, he, he, he did a cover of You Can Wear My Hat. And actually, and you donned a very, very nice lady's hat. And it's actually left me psychiatric scarred. I'm, I'm, I'm still at the <laughs> now. But, uh, <laughs> I can't unsee that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have it somewhere around here too. <laughs> Yeah, That's pretty wild. you know, Phil Collins is, he's, he's literally a, a, an international treasure, you know, oh, yeah. dear Fran, and one of the most gifted, uh, talented musicians I've ever had the pleasure of, of working with. And uh, to this day, he just remains a, a, a close and, and a wonderful friend and, and one of my favorite artists. Well, I will say this much, you know, Roger and I have looked at uh, the list of all of the people you've played with, and I think I burned up my printer trying to print <laughs> the full list. Uh, we're going to address a lot of that. But Nathan, one of the first things I wanted to start with, you know, Roger was talking about your early childhood. I know that you had mentioned that some of your early influences, at least early on, were Charles Mingus and Ray Brown and Ron Carter on the upright bass, and then James Jamerson, Paul McCartney and Chuck Rainey on electric bass. And I don't think there are too many folks that would argue with that list. <laughs> but what I do want to say is that I absolutely love Charles Mingus. And in my humble opinion, I would say that Mingus was one of the most impactful musicians of the 20th century, not just bassists, but musicians. Uh, Mingus was a, a virtuoso bassist, a prolific composer, had over 300 compositions and over 100 albums to his name. And he also became an internationally renowned band leader. I mean, he wowed the world as a band leader. So Nathan, I would love to know, what was it about Charles Mingus that struck such a deep chord with you? Well, uh, you know, much like Ron Carter and, and, and some of the play, bass players, Scott LaFaro, mm. but Mingus became a leader and I was, I was thoroughly impressed by 
if he had never become a leader, but when he did, it just lets you know the power of that instrument that he had in his hand. And as a young student of the instrument, you look to people like that and he's doing with it what nobody has done basically. And, and it's done with heart and soul. And, and so his contribution is, is far and wide. And, you know, as, as a student of the bass, I, I really listen to players like him. Um, Monk Montgomery, same thing, where he took the electric bass yep. and he started playing melodies on it. He made an album called Reality. And, mm -hmm. I, and I'll never forget just listening to say, just saying, how cool is that? Like he stepped out and of course, whatever was in the blood in the Montgomery family, their taste right. and everything about what they, what they chose to play was, was anointed, <laughs> you know? So uh, when you talk about people like Mingus, uh, he, he stands in a category all by himself. Well, Charles was one of the, was, the, I think, the bassist that literally said, I am not just a rhythm instrument. You know, <laughs> right. it's not just the drums and, and the bass that's going to be the, the heart and soul of the rhythm. And of course it is. But to right. be able to step forward, play melodies, plus right. be able to compose for a trio format all the way to a full symphony. I mean, it's, not everything. it's, a, it's a shame we lost him as early as we did. Okay, so our very, very special guest. At the tender age of 16, he got his first break when he found himself on the road with the one and only Mr. Barry White. I mean, does it get much better than that? And then So it I'm, just makes it even more amazing. Oh, yeah. But then the phone started to ring, and you picked the phone up, and it wasn't a call center. It was... Quincy Jones. All right. So the Quincy Jones is on the phone to you. And then the phone just kept ringing then. And it just kept ringing in, in 40 years. I mean, let's just run very, very quickly. I'm going to go through Eric Clapton, Michael Bublé, George Harrison, Michael Jackson, Phil Collins, David Foster, Whitney Houston, Beyonce, Barbara Streisand, and Stevie Wonder. Okay, Roger. Catch, catch your breath, buddy. Catch your breath. Nathan, Nathan, I'm going to go ahead and carry that list a little bit further for Roger while he takes a sip. So your, that list also includes Al Jarreau, Hubert Laws, Anita Baker, Joe Sample, B.B. King, Steve Winwood, Herbie Hancock, Elton John, Earth, Wind & Fire, Joe Satriani, who was the very first artist to follow me on Twitter. Ger uh, wow. Gerald Albright was second, but wow. Joe beat him to the punch. Brian Culbertson, Earl Clue, Chikoria, David Benoit, Norman Brown, Keiko Matsui, and Kevmo. And again, people, everybody that's listening, that's only a fraction of the people that Nathan has played with. Now, in 2014, Nathan, you released your self-titled debut album, Nathan East on the Yamaha Entertainment Group label. Hey, there it is. To, <laughs> which went to number one on the Billboard Jazz charts. And you also picked up a Grammy nomination for Best Contemporary Instrumental Album. Then in 2016, your sophomore project, you release, uh, is it Reverence? Reverence. Reverence, Reverence, mm -hmm. Reverence which also reached hey. number one on <laughs> Billboard. Is. Wow. So that's just an incredible, I mean, people can't wrap their heads around that. They have two projects hit number one on Billboard. So my question to you is, what did you glean from your years in studio and on tour that positioned you for such a tremendous start as a soloist? Well, I mean, it's, it's funny because I, I never kind of just stop and, and look back. I just got, you know, you got to keep looking forward. And, and it's just amazing that if you, if you kind of keep going, you never really know what's going to happen, especially in the music business where there's no prescribed way to, to get from one level to the next. Um, it is, it is something, you know, my years with foreplay, I must have spent, you know, at least the first 20 where the guys were saying, hey, when are you going to do your own solo album? <laughs> because foreplay became sort of my, my solo adventure, you know, where I could write and, and it was a project that I had. I was a one quarter member uh, participating in touring and recording. So that was good. But yeah, it was, it was really, um, it was really fun and, and, and felt great to, to step out of, with the uh, assistance of a great label, Yamaha Entertainment Group, which mm. I've been playing their basses for 40 years. Uh, my friend Chris Giro uh, running the label and, and had, again, had ideas 
that he said, come on, let's go and do this. You know, and I remember uh, dear brother Chuck Love, we sat outside in Montreux Jazz, outside the Montreux Jazz Festival on the lake there. And we literally wrote down, okay, what would be the dream team of people to play on the record? And what kind of songs would we do? So we got the party started and it was just a matter of like plugging it in and, and going. So uh, lots of fun to do it. Uh, recently, I've been sort of doing the similar thing, playing with my son, Noah, who plays mm -hmm. piano and Hammond organ. And again, something that I've never done, but he was featured on both my albums uh, on, yes. on duets. And yes. so um, we're thinking an album of that material uh, that would be will awesome. be forthcoming. Excellent. Well, yeah. we're going to actually play a, a track from the album now, but before then, I mean, there's certainly a lot of influence. You, there's about four or five tracks there, which are covers of the wonderful Earth, and Fire. So obviously there's a lot of influence there for Earth, and Fire. So, um, and of course, Verdian White, a big fan there? I'm the biggest Verdian White fan ever <laughs> and have been for, uh, for a long time. And he's, he's a dear friend of mine. Um, and, and the other thing, like when you were naming those names, I was just thinking you were just kind of naming everybody in my record collection, you know, and, and it was literally A to Z, you know. My father had Barbara Streisand albums, West Montgomery albums, but then we were all over the place with Earth, Wind & Fire, Tower of Power, mm -hmm. Chicago, Blood, Sweat & Tears, Elton mm -hmm. John, all the mm -hmm. Motown stuff, Marvin Gaye, Barry White, you know, I mean, Al Green, it was, it was just literally uh, and, and back in the day, you'd hear Jimi Hendrix on the radio and the next song would be oh, by yeah. Miles Davis, you know? <laughs> and so there was no, there wasn't like putting people in genres and categories. It was just a fertile, fertile ground of music to choose from. And I, uh, you know, Eric Clapton, you know, and I was a yeah. big Cream fan, listening in my room playing Sunshine of Your Love, these bass lines and Jack oh. Bruce. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, right now it's it's literally like living the dream when you when you think that these people are friends and they, you know, wow. I look at my phone, it rings sometimes there's Ringo on the line, you know, <laughs> it's just, it's amazing. <laughs> so it's coming to, now, this is, people going to, anybody watching is going to turn around and say, this has all been scripted. You know what's up. <laughs> <laughs> scripted. You just mentioned Erica. We are momentarily going to just break now and play a track from the self-titled album, uh, Nathan is, and we're going to play Can't Find My Way Home, featuring the man himself, Eric Clapton. Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching Jazz Across the Pond. We've got the fabulous Mr. Nathan East sat there. We've got Mr. G sat there. We'll be back momentarily. Have a listen to this. You're going to love it. Back in a moment.
Well, we have just been listening to the most amazing track featuring the wonderful Eric Clapton. And we've got the man himself here. We've got Nathan East, who's eager to answer more of our questions. And boy, we've got some great questions coming up. Nathan, you co I didn't realise this. I'm a DJ in England. I've been for fo over 40 years. And I, I use right. I play the Phil Collins and Phil Bailey Easy Lover. And the, the dance floor packed. And I stand, I apologise humbly. I didn't realise you co-wrote the song. <laughs> Clap on the wrist for that one there. And of course, also in 2013, and you recorded the bass line for the wonderful 2013 hit Get Lucky, which we opened the show up. Can you tell our followers more about the, the easy level with Phil Bailey of Earth, Wind & Fire and Phil Collins, of course, of Genesis, the co-writing that song. And also, we understand there's a great storyline about the Get Lucky, and they were lucky to get you, to be honest with you, Sean. Oh, well, thank you. You know, uh, we recorded Easy Lover in Shepherd's Bush, probably not too far from where you are now. And nope. uh, there was a studio called The Townhouse, and we were there. That was my first trip to England. And we were there uh, for two weeks. We stayed out in, in, uh, at a place called the Gr Bramley Grange Hotel out in uh, Guildford. Yep. And uh, Phil Collins would come pick Philip and I up in the morning, and we'd drive the, what, what would it be, the M25 or whatever, so but it was... Uh, the M25, it, it, the world's biggest car park, because no one can drive it. <laughs> right, exactly. And um, so, and Phil would, Phil would race to the studio and we, we'd have a, the greatest time. And we wrote that probably the last couple of days of the session where, you know, Philip said, oh, we still need like a single, you know, that the label can pick and, and play. And we literally went over to the piano and started to just kind of bang out the chords. I was sitting there and uh, came up with the intro and kind of the, the hook chords. And then we, you know, started singing along. And the next thing you know, you know, it was Choosy Lover at first. Um, and then we had sort of a sketch in about 20 minutes, uh, uh, an idea of a form. And so we went to record it that evening as a demo to listen to overnight and come in and, and, and record the next morning. We got back, played it the next morning. And we all said, hey, what do you think about the track? I mean, I like it, you like it, like it. So that was the track. And Phil was singing some lyrics that he came up with. And, and I said, you know what? You, you sound good singing. I know it's Philip Bailey's record, but what about a duet? You know, so it literally so organically came together mm. as, as uh, something. And, and I can remember hearing it on three radio stations at once thinking, yes. <laughs> <You know? laughs> And, and speaking of hearing songs on different radio sets, and Get Lucky came out, and I would hear it. I would hear it on the street. I'd hear it coming out of apartments, uh, especially traveling through Europe and Italy and Paris. And uh, the song just blew up bigger than anybody I'm sure could have ever imagined. And and, and it's just so much fun to be part of music that people embrace uh, around the globe. It's just. Uh, it's an opportunity that I'm forever grateful for. Well, you're a very modest man because, and that's right, it was your intervention that made it a big hit. Are we right in saying that? Well, I had, I had two, two tries at the baseline uh, on Get Lucky. Uh, we recorded it and then they took it back to Nile Rodgers and, and Pharrell, they, they put the lyrics in. So when, when we recorded, it was just an instrumental. And when it got back to LA, I, I asked the guys if we could just hit record and, and give another go at the bass. And I, I gave it the Bernard Edwards chic approach, <laughs> you know. And uh, I, did, I did my best Bernard Edwards impersonation. And uh, that's, what, that's what came up with it. And everybody was dancing in the studio. And, and it just felt, it was a feel good, feel good song to this day still. Brilliant. Kevin. Yeah, yeah that was the finishing piece to it, no doubt. Well, Nathan, I did want to ask you a question. In, uh, in 1991, you became a founding member of the contemporary jazz supergroup Foreplay, along with Bob James on keys, Lee Rittenauer on guitar, and Harvey Mason on drums. We just interviewed uh, Bob James three weeks ago, and I'm going to ask you a question I put to Bob. But let me lead it with uh, Foreplay recorded 14 albums, and the, the group only saw really two personnel changes with guitarist uh, Larry Carlton replacing Lee Rittenauer, and then of course the late great Mr. Chuck Loeb replacing Larry Carlton. Now I think most people would agree that Rittenauer, Carlton, and Loeb, who unfortunately we tragically lost on July 31st of 2017, are by far three of the greatest contemporary jazz guitarists of our time. So the question I asked Bob, and I'm gonna ask you the same question and get your take on it, 
Is there anyone who can fill that honored fourth spot on foreplay? Well, I, I think of it in terms of Chuck really solidified his position in the band. And, and after Lee and Larry, who are two wonderful musicians and, oh, and great friends, um, Chuck, for me, was was like those two guys put together and then him, you know, like he right. he ticked every box you could ever <laughs> imagine, you know. And on top of all of that, the best guy to hang out with. I mean, after the gigs, we'd stand outside of each other's hotel rooms talking <laughs> for two hours sometimes, so four in the morning or whatever. Just, but he was just such a great human being. And uh, that kind of humanity is, is hard to replace. They're, they're yeah. wonderful musicians and, and guitarists around the world, but that particular element, element of foreplay will, uh, will go with Chuck, you know. And, um, but however, we, we still aspire to go down the road and continue the, the foreplay sound and, and um, however, whatever incarnation that is, uh, right. we're, we're still kind of coming up with it. Oh, brilliant. Well, one such uh, moment was the triumphant reimagining of one of my heroes, Pat Matheny. And you did this uh, the letter from home. A fab I, 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 I always stay clear of anybody who could try attempt to do a Pat Matheny song. You did <laughs> the most amazing uh, copy of that one there on your debut self-titled album. You were once quoted as saying, I tend to lean towards passionate ballads. And I've even asked my very, very good friend, Michael McDonald, one of your favorite singers, to join you on the album. And boy, didn't he come across it. Now, let's just stop and take stock for a second. It's your <laughs> debut album, and you had Michael McDonald, Eric Clapton, Stevie Wonder. I mean, they must have said, okay, Nathan East is going to record. We want to be a part of this. This is history making. <laughs> so incredible. So, Ed, can you tell us a little bit about, I mean, you suddenly went, after the foreplay, you went, okay, I'm going to release my solo album. I mean, were you... Did it, did it hit all the marks or was there anything you thought, oh no, did, did you come away from them and went, do you know what, that was incredible? I'll tell you what, all of those guys you just mentioned working with, they were so sweet. I mean, Ray Parker called me from, Ray Parker Jr. called me from Switzerland and said, I hear you're doing a solo album. You will not finish that album without me being on it. And, and that's <laughs> his, his opening line, is the guitar line on Daft Funk on the record. Um, Pat Matheny has uh, created the soundtrack to my life, you know, uh, mm -hmm. for many years. Also become a dear friend. When, when we recorded Letter From Home, I remember sending it to him that night after I left the studio around 11.30 midnight. And uh, when I woke up the next morning at 6 a.m., he, he had sent his uh, approval, <laughs> you know, and his blessing on the song. And I thought, that's all you could wish for, you know. Uh, and, and just, you, you mentioned all the artists that I have so much reverence and respect for, and you think, yeah, Michael McDonald, you know, come on, <laughs> it's, it's amazing. And, and, you know, the, I call these people Stevie Wonder, who, you know, also soundtrack of my life, you know, grew up listening to him and, and just feel like he's part of our DNA, you know, so uh when when i was uh playing um when i was playing overjoyed at one of our rehearsals for one of the the gigs it was sting's rainforest benefit we do in uh new york at carnegie hall stevie was on just happened, and I, just happened to be sting. <laughs> yeah and uh so i was on uh I, I was kind of fooling around with the chord changes of the of the song on the bass and and uh as i'm playing you know we were on a break of rehearsal the next thing you know i hear a harmonica playing the melody along with me, Steve. <laughs> you know, so there's Stevie and now, you know, there's George Harrison, Elton John, all these people that were participating, but they were on the sideline, like listening, Bonnie Raitt. And now I'm like, I'm working out the chord changes in real time. Like I, had, I was just kind of fooling around with it. Next day, who knew that Stevie Wonder would jump and start playing harmonica. And uh, we ended the tune and everybody started, started applause applauding and then stevie came over and said if you ever record that song you have to call me oh, you know? wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> so i oh, took him i mean well, how can you how could you not take yeah. someone up on an offer like that well Absolutely. before kevin jumps in i've got to say that i mean a lot of people refer they say that when they hear the beatles it changed their life forever 
I can hand on heart turn around and say, it was in the early 1980s, a very, very good jazz pianist who's no longer with us, unfortunately now, had loaned me a vinyl copy of Still mm. Life Talking, Pat Metheny, and it wow. changed my life forever. I listened to that and I've, I've never been the same since. It was just like... <laughs> no, uh, still to this day, yeah. Still to, still this, day, to yeah. this day, yeah. Kevin. Yeah. Yeah, Nathan, I'd also like to ask you about uh, your time performing and recording with the legendary Mr. Chikoria. Uh, February the 9th of uh, 2021 was a devastating day for our generation. The news of the death of uh, Chikoria swept the world. Uh, you performed in Jakarta with Chick, and uh, he performed on Shadow from your 2016 project. And uh, we're going to be playing that song to close out uh, the show today. But if you would be so kind, would you share with us what was it about Chick that impressed you so much? Well, I mean, again, talk about albums that change your life and then uh, Where Have I Known You Before and Return to Forever back in the day were albums that literally I never stopped playing. Um, mm -hmm. And I used, to, I used to learn Stanley Clark solos note for note and I knew all the solos and all the songs. Like I could play that album um, from top to bottom. And it was just... It just was part of, again, part of my, my DNA. And Chick, uh, we had a chance to play on the Hubert Laws family album. We did the mm. song Rebel, Rebel's Bolero. Yeah. And Chick, play, Chick played on that. And it wasn't until 35 years later that we had a chance to play together. He, uh, he called me to sub for John Patitucci and the Electric Band on tour, which uh, no pressure there, right? <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> And our no first small, no small shoes there. <laughs> no, our first gig was was in Jakarta, and my only rehearsal was sort of sound check that afternoon um, at the hotel. Uh, he sent me the songs and the charts uh, a month or so prior, and uh, again, you know, his music is so near and dear to my heart that I had a lot in me already. But right. uh, yeah, I learned I learned those songs, and when I went to do my second album, you know, the song Shadow which was actually written for my, my younger brother and his sons. They had a dog named Shadow that got hit by a car and I was oh. so heartbroken. So that, that song is named after Shadow. And, uh, and uh, that's like a, an inside story that, that people probably wouldn't know. But, uh, you know, that Chick Corea sound was the sound I had in my head for, uh, for the synth party. And he came and he was actually, he was actually at the Blue Note doing like, 80 shows or something. He was on a month long residency. And when I called him, he said, sure, send me the, send me the song. And in between sets, he ran up to his, uh, his hotel room and, or, or on a day off. And he, he laid down that part for me and I'll, I'll forever f be grateful to him and, and have that in my heart as, as something that connects us for life. That's pretty incredible. Thank you for sharing that story, man. Whilst we're talking about heartwarming stories, destined to capture every heart in, uh, in your own duet on the wonderful track yesterday, your 13-year-old son then, uh, he, was, he was 13 then, Noah, uh, <laughs> right. now plays, he plays the piano, came into the studio apparently, put the headphones on, and the sound was so beautiful, his face lit up. And he then decided he's going to be a part of this album. You are changing, uh, one moment you are changing diapers with him, next minute you're sitting there <laughs> playing piano on your thing. So tell us more about that most amazing occasion. There you are sitting there playing with your son there. No, there's nothing better. I, I uh, And he he was just, you know, he put on the headphones and heard the sound. We, we were at a studio called United in Los Angeles and, and literally state of the art of the art, you know, and, um, mm. and, so to see his face light up and, and you, there's no way to describe the feeling of, of playing with your son and hearing those beautiful chords. That was an arrangement that he was um, working on uh, at a place called Piano Play here in LA that he was taking lessons and uh, studying. And so the arrangement was so beautiful and I played it for uh, my producer, Chris Giro, and he loved it and he said, you know what, this, this has to go on the record and uh, he even, came up with the idea of asking Noah and Mike to say, okay, are you ready, dad? <laughs> you know, ready, son. And, and uh, every time I hear it, it just, you know, it just brings tears of joy. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, Kevin. Roger, Roger, and I, Roger and I actually had a little time to be able to speak to that. I mean, 
people's perspectives change as they as they go through life and obviously having children is very it's very impactful on our lives but you know they if you sit back and think about it there aren't too many opportunities for dads and their their children to be able to interact in a way i mean outside of the relationship of father and son in your case uh, but to be able to sit down with your son and play music together i mean for me it was emotional uh, playing in my high school band and in my college band uh, with a group of people that I'm not related. Very emotional thing for me. Uh, but to be able to do that with your son, I mean, I can't imagine the types of emotions that just went through you in that process. Yeah, you know, I have to, I just have to keep from tearing up every time we even play together to this day because he, uh, the other thing is uh, last year during COVID, he was home and and uh, he was so uh, enamored with the Hammond organ. And he said, if, if wow. there's one thing <laughs> that I would want for life, one gift, it would be a Hammond. So we were able to find him a Hammond at one of the churches, had it delivered here to the living room. And, and uh, he's taken wow. it to it. Um, he's really taken to it. So we, we sit there and play until four in the morning. Uh, bless my wife and, and daughter for... <laughs> 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 We're having to sleep through it, but we just can't stop. And it's it's the most fun I, I think I can ever have. He's turned into one of my favorite musicians, period. His Just his approach. And uh, it's his heart is so big uh, when he plays, and that, it comes out through his playing. So, I mean, our plan is to definitely record an album together. Uh, a that, duo would album. Awesome. That, would, yeah. that would be awesome. That would be awesome. Tell me, the Hammond organ, have you got a Leslie speaker with it as well? Uh, we have two Leslie speakers at home. <laughs> One of the, a friend saw him, uh, we were playing a, a, a show on TV and he was playing Hammond organ and a friend, a pastor from a church, he, he called me up and he says, I have my mom's Leslie. After she passed away, it's just been here. And if, if you can get over here to pick it up, it's yours. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know, so wow. he was so impressed with Noah. He, so he gave us a beautiful Leslie and, uh, and we had already been using another one. So it's, it fills the house with this most amazing sound. Uh, still to this day, I kind of imagine how 60 years ago they could create an instrument that is still so relevant today. Well, a lot Absolutely. of people, our followers may not realize, because uh, I used to sell organs many, many years ago, and the Leslie wow. speaker, it's a, it's a rotating, oscillating speaker. And it was done by right. a guy called Doppler. And what he did, he heard an ambulance come, to walk, come from behind him, pass him, and carry on down. And he realized how the picture changed as it went through. Right. So he came up with the idea of the Leslie speaker. And that's why the speaker spins around. It's amazing. And, and there's, like, when you hear it, when you, you know, cause a lot of organ players, they'll have it on and off. And, and when you hear it come on, it just, it just takes the sound and just. To another level. To another level. And, and it's so expressive and, and uh, it, it really is an, the Hammond organ really is still such an amazing instrument. And we've had a, we've had a lot of fun playing together. So, so we'll, we'll definitely be featuring that on the record. Well, the, yeah. I mean, as if uh, gospel, as if, go ahead, I'm sorry, Roger, go ahead. No, I was going to say, the, uh, yeah. it's fabulous news you're talking about the, the duet album because, of course, uh, we, we've already mentioned Bob James was a uh, guest here three weeks ago and, of course, The New Cool, which was a wonderful album. Hey, yeah. that was, that's another that's great, great project. Yeah. Stuff and Bob James, yeah. we're worth adding to your collection and that. But I tell you what, if this new album comes out, I'm going to be, and Kevin and myself are going to be front of the queue, front, front of the line <laughs> to get a copy of that one, I'll tell you. Ah, uh, thank you. No, it's, we're, we're excited. And, and I just, again after all these years in the business to be able to do something new for me that I haven't done, you know, uh, like right. doing an album with my son is, is it just makes it that much more exciting. Kevin question for yourself, sir. Yes. Nathan, uh, you once said that the thing I love most about the recording process is that you never know exactly what's going to happen. Isn't that true? Uh, you said, I always Absolutely. leave room for that element of surprise because so often it's what you didn't plan on that turns into the focal point. It's that magical moment on the record. So we've spoken to the magic, obviously working with Noah. So we're gonna set that aside. And I'm gonna ask you if you would share with our viewers another moment when something unplanned became a magical focal point for you. Oh, you know, those, those are the moments that you, you live for uh, many times. And, and Quincy Jones, 
he always says, you know, you can tell when God walks in the room. <laughs> you know, and right. he said, and he says, all of a sudden, you take something that is just literally uh, on the floor, and it becomes some kind of supernatural event. You know, and and right. he certainly has has uh, made some great records. Have had a lot of magic moments in the studio with him, and and just in general, um, all the people that I've had a chance to work with. He, you get in the studio and the room is filled with the highest level musicians. You know, you look around and, and there's, you know, David Foster or David Page or Clapton or Bill Collins or, you know, like these great people, George Duke, people that I've admired, Bob James. Um, and, and so everybody's level is starts very high, but then when you, when you get it, put it together, there's something else that happens that you can't really explain. You can't, plan it you can't you can't rehearse it it just happens and when it happens uh it's one of the most amazing things ever right so the followers of just across the pond uh two, three albums definitely add to your collection the title album nathan <laughs> get it get it get it reverend incredible album again <laughs> and the new call and you've been watching jazz across the pond jazz interviews reimagined the gentleman we are talking to is the number one bass player in the world. We've been wanting to get you onto our show for a long, long time, but your phone is always engaged. Every time we ring, there's always somebody on the phone, <laughs> Quincy Jones or whatever. So we have to sit there and we go, unfortunately, the line is busy. So we've, we've waited patiently. And that we thank you so much for taking time out of your day to come and join us on the show, sir. It is indeed a pleasure. And I'm, I'm humbled by the opportunity and the fact that just the... Uh, Music business is still here for us to participate in as long as uh, as long as we can. Kevin, say good night. Well, well, Nathan, thank you very much for sharing time with us today. And just so that everybody knows, uh, we're going to be closing out the interview with the amazing track "Shadow" that we spoke about earlier, featuring the legendary Mr. Chickaree on keys from Nathan's outstanding 2016 solo project. So, Nathan, again, thank you so much. Uh, you, uh, your fans on both sides of the pond are thrilled. Uh, we'll be thrilled with this interview, and we thank you very much for being here today. Thanks so much, guys, and uh, continued blessings. Thank Nathan, you, ladies and gentlemen, you're watching the wonderful Nathan. Is It's Jazz Across the Pond with Mr. G and myself, the Jazz Cat. Take care, look up, and stay safe in this crazy world. <laughs>